Hello everyone. In this last part of the Colibri basic module on network security, I will go into more depth with the challenges in doing traffic classification and when it comes to botnets. And I will say that much of the work is something done at Albert University and it's something I've been doing in collaboration with other staff and in collaboration with students. And therefore I have also reused some of the figures from, from other students and staff presentations. So all credit goes to all these uh, friendly guys. So in the last theme we learned that uh, in order to do traffic classification we need good data sets. And I promise to get back with more details in this part. This is what I'm doing now. So what we need is correctly classified data sets of first of all which should be a representative of botnet behavior so covering different different botnets and different kinds of botnets and also representative normal traffic without botnet behavior whatever that is because what is representative normal traffic if I have uh, our university network the traffic here will be different from what it is in a company network will be different from what it is in an ISP will be different from a mobile provider uh, so this is not so easy. Um, in this presentation we'll look at some of the many challenges we experience when we try to do this. And in fact we might also realize that um, we were talking before about saying we have the Benin traffic and we have the botnet traffic. But in fact within the Benin traffic we have many different kinds of traffic. And within botnet traffic we also have many different kinds of traffic. Um, and we do not know if botnet traffic can be, can be characterized as a group which has specific features. We believe so and it's somewhat supported by data. But um, it's not so trivial to say that of course we can see a difference between Benin traffic and botnet traffic. So it's all about the data. And it's a chance to find correctly labeled data sets. Um, and see here, it's not difficult to find data sets, but it's difficult to find correctly labeled data sets. Um, if we look at um, the, the data sets for Benin traffic, so for non-malicious traffic, we might be able to find data sets which we believe contain no malicious traffic. Uh, if it is, for example, from a university or a company network, where there is a, a good deal of security and there is a control with what is installed in different devices. Um, the question is, will this data set cover the applications used by other users, for example, in an ISP? It's an open question. Also, um, the maybe more tricky question is how to obtain correctly classified data sets with malicious traffic. Um, so we might be able to get our hands on a data set from an ISP or from a user, but how do we know for each flow if it is um, malicious traffic or if it is non-malicious traffic. What is often done in the literature is that uh, there is done some kind of automatic labeling. So we receive a lot of flows, we run it through an automatic classifier, for example an uh, intuition detection system, but we are of course afraid that when we don't go through it by hand, so to speak, that there can be systematic errors because if there is an error in the system that we use for labeling, then we also have an error in the uh, algorithms we are producing. Um, we also know, because it, it, you can be tempted to say, okay, we're trying to run a lot of malware in a closed environment, and this is in fact also what we're doing, but we have to be aware that the more advanced bots may behave differently if they are not exposed to a real environment. So it's the field that they are trapped, if they observe that they cannot get access to, uh, to the internet or to specific servers, they might behave differently than if they were uh, out on the open internet. And I would also just state shortly that working with real botware and real manware raises both legal and ethical concerns, um, especially as a university we don't want to do anything which could potentially harm other users. So how to get the data set? Well, um, as I said, finding data in a real environment uh, can be challenging, so we need to use honeypots or honey nets. So what it is, uh, very short, uh, the very short story, is that we establish some closed environments 
where malware can be run in a controlled fashion. And in the case here, I'm showing a honeypot which is actually connected to the internet. And if you do so, it's important to take the necessary measures in order to ensure that you don't do anything harmful to, uh, to other users. So, if what we do is that we obtain some malicious data or uh, malicious traces from our honeypot and we try to mix it with real data from the real internet, um, there are a number of challenges. Um, one is that if tracking is, is from different networks, there could be some specific characteristics that could be interpreted as specific to malicious or benign traffic. So, for example, I could have a uh, my control network uh, where I collect my, my bot traces and because it's a controlled environment um, it might be located in a university which has a very fast internet connection uh, it might be that I use try to build as much as possible within my network so I might have a DNS server, I might have other infrastructure uh, within my, my own specific network so there I would have a very low uh, latency and very low Delay from when a sender packet or receiver packet pack could be very quick. Whereas if I then have some uh, real traffic from a different network which has a longer uh, latency time, then I would see a difference. Uh, and I would be I would probably um, train my data so that if I could see that there was a long latency before receiving response, this would be likely to be benign traffic. But the very quick reply would be related to bonnet traffic. Of course this would be wrong, so I need to, um, to take care that these kind of characteristics will not dominate when I mix the benign traffic from one place with the button traffic from another place. Also we are risking to lose some information. For example if the bot generated traffic cannot be assumed to be independent of on, uh, other kinds of traffic. That could for example be that uh, in the real world it might, uh, I might have a bot which is only active as soon as I'm using my, my web bank, web bank um, meaning that there is a correlation between the benign traffic and the malicious traffic. And that I would not catch if I was trying to say, okay, I have one data set with malicious traffic and one data set with benign traffic. Also, another challenge is that it's not trivial to decide what traffic should be labels, uh, labeled as malicious and what should be labeled as non-malicious. For example, um, a bot can create a simple web request to check that it's actually online. So it makes a request to Google and it receives the web page. This will look just like any other uh, web request, so it will look completely like Benin traffic. And we can also say that it is Benin because it's not harmful. Um, but what if it's two or three or four or hundred or ten thousand Google requests? Then it would be different. It also means that I, I somehow need to have a, a definition of what is um, malicious and non-malicious. And if the definition is that everything that is created by malware is malicious, then, then according to that definition, a Google request would be, would be malicious. Uh, and that, that would kind of uh, be impossible to see the difference between the malicious and non-malicious traffic. So that's another, that's another challenge. A potential solution to mixing the traffic sets uh, is by mapping trace files from bot infected computers to computers generating a, a non malicious trace. Um, so basically, what I'm showing here is that I have um, some background traffic. This is what I see to the right from a network which is collected and I know what it looks like. Then to the left side, I have um, a collection of bot traffic. And I observe some important things, for example, how many packets do I have, how much of it is TCP, how much of it is UDP, how much of it is from different protocols. Uh, and then I, can, then I can mix it so that I uh, take hand on these uh, inherent differences. And that I can do, for example, by mapping the traffic. So I could say, okay, everything that comes from my... Um, uh, from the computer called 10.0.0.10 I'm mapped to a, a specific computer who also produced Benin traffic and from another computer 10.0.0.1 I've mapped that to the traffic uh, or to the computer to another 
of the Benin computers. So what I do is in the trace, sorry if this is a bit technical, but then you, you simply replace the IP address of the, of the one computer with that of the other computer. So you can say that you have the, the malicious trace from a, from a well, the trace from a malicious computer, the malicious trace, and you you map all that so it looks like it comes from one of the other computers, and you have another computer with malicious traffic, and you take all that traffic and map it to one of the computers who had um, the Benin traffic. So that is one way of merging the two data sets in a way so that it becomes uh, looking like one data set without the skewness that you could uh, be afraid of introducing. But still, even though this is, I think it's a, it's a good approach and it's a viable approach, but you still have the challenges that uh, I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, another challenge is how to generate these malicious data sets. So uh, what we do in the AIU Honeydark project is an example of how to handle it. Um, so we are working based on uh, the assumption that the bot, the bot must, brought, must be brought to believe that it's actually a part of a working network um, and activities should be carried out on the machine. So it should be active, for example, uh, um, it should uh, be visiting web pages, it should uh, access Facebook, log into Facebook, log out again and so on. So there has to be some kind of um, normal behavior on the machine, otherwise the bot could guess that it's trapped. Also it should be secured from the outside world um, and if access to the outside is necessary, then it must be handled in a controlled manner so we don't let any malicious traffic uh, leave, leave our machine. It also should be possible to operate, monitor and control the system without too much weight, so it should be as automatic as possible. For example, it should be possible to automatically wipe it in order to install and play with new kind of malware. Um, it should be easy to yeah, that's what I just said, to reset the infected machines to our new experiments. And um, uh, just a, a final note is that AAU Honigia is a project that is mainly run by master students and therefore all the credits in the following slides should go to these guys. So the principle we have is that we have three main components. We have a containment component which is all about um, making sure that no harmful traffic is leaving our test environment and going onto the internet but allowing the necessary control traffic to go through. There is a monitoring and analysis part where you collect the data traces uh, and we can analyze them. And there is a test environment in itself which contains both physical machines and virtual machines. Uh, it's possible to control it centrally, so from one machine you can, you can order which malware should be installed where and you, we have some scripts that make sure that you can actually operate the their computers and, and make them behave like normal users without having to sit and, and, and do it actually um, yourself. And there is infrastructure for emulating the internet so you can access basic internet services and the computers will believe that they are online even though they are behind the, the containment. Uh, within the test environment there is a number of PCs uh, and our virtual machines which can be infected. As I said, we have these uh, scripts, we have the emulated uh, internet, and we have the possibility to control, control the inmates from a central machine. In the containment part, uh, all outgoing traffic is filtered, but some connections can be allowed um, if we know that it's harmless. And there are different approaches to say, okay, when do we know that something is harmless? It can be either a manual inspection, say, okay, we can see that the traffic to the receive IP address is, is harmless, so we let it through, but it can also be semi-automatic or over time full automatic. Um, and this module is uh, under uh, development. Um, what I would like to give one, uh, one example of is how a connection can be initially screened using TCP injection. And in that I will show on the next slide. So in this case, an inmate, so one of the machines who are in the, in the test setup is trying to establish a TCP handshake um, with, with an IRC server, so with the malicious IRC server which is used for command and control. So he sends first a send packet, that's the first part of a TCP handshake. It receives back a send act packet 
and uh, finally an egg packet in order to complete the handshake. But what we see in the figure is that actually we don't uh, let this traffic go through to the IRC server. Instead we intercept it in what we call the handshake module. Uh, and what we do in the handshake module is that we send the Synac back uh, to make the inmate believe that it's actually connected to the internet. So as long as it's only communicating with the handshake module, we are only communicating within our uh, closed environment but the inmate believes that it since it gets a response it's actually connected to the internet. So after successfully from the inmate, inmate point of view establishing connection it will start send uh, the NIC which is indicating that this is IRC uh, traffic um, and which is used in order to connect to the, um, to the command and control server. But when it sends, it sends the NIC it, we are resetting the connection in order for, for, the, for the inmate to establish a new connection. And when this new connection is established, we actually let it through to the IRC server because we have already seen that what was, what was happening so far is malicious, so we dare to let it through. So this is an example from uh, something we did in a student project. Then for the monitoring part, that's the last part I will say something about. Uh, okay, the monitoring components allow for monitoring all the network activity. And the biggest, uh, one of the big challenges there is, is to handle the large amount of data. Uh, so in AAU Honeyjar, we have a relatively small test setup, so it's it's manageable. But if you have a large network, uh, an ISP network, with uh, several um, a gigabit of data, then there is a lot of uh, a lot of challenges in order to be able to handle the data, and and in order to be able to to store and process it, process it as well. But just getting it out of the network um, without affecting the network performance, uh, for example, taking it out of a router without affecting how fast the router is, and uh, and storing it and later on processing it is actually a challenge. So that was about some of the challenges that we are working on and some of the challenges um, that there are when working with traffic analysis in order to do botnet detection. So it's the last. Uh, part. It's end of the theme 4. So please finish this by taking the questions available in Moodle. And when you have done this, so there is an overall questionnaire about all the uh, all the aspects that we covered in this basic module. And then I will finally say that I'm looking forward to meet you all in Istanbul. And if you have any questions, you are welcome to, um, to send them to me by email, to put them in the Colibri forum and otherwise we'll be able to clarify everything that has been in the seminar in Istanbul. So, thank you very much.